Hey, you guys about ready for the what if shoot? Yeah, we're about there, but uh, something weird keeps happening. There was a time. That is weird. Yeah, it just keeps happening. When the local host reigned supreme. There it is again. Yeah, it's really weird. Maybe it's trying to tell us something, something that's about to happen. Maybe something later in the show? How are we feeling? An entrepreneur whose business is himself. Taking robotic surgery and making it smaller. Celebrating nerd creativity. Yo, what if? All the world's a stage, right? For Shakespeare, students here at Nebraska Wesleyan, and the creators featured in this episode of our series on innovation and creativity in Nebraska, What If? We start with the story of an entrepreneur whose business is being in front of an audience. For years, What If? has told you about lots of entrepreneurs who've created lots of cool things. D. Wayne Taylor created himself. Woo! <laughs> Let's do this thing. Hey, what's up? I'm D. Wayne, and I'm a vocal entrepreneur. So what is the D. Wayne brand? Ooh, the D. Wayne brand is uh, vocal entrepreneurship. And, you know, the focus being on forming a communicative asset, right? I want companies or individuals to look at me and go, oh, I bet my message to my audience could go through easier if I had him. I want to know everything that you do as a business right now. Um, Just list it all. So I'm a, a host Yo, slash cool. master of ceremonies, a public speaking coach. I'm a radio host, TV host, freelance commercial host, a voiceover artist, and I'm pretty sure I'm missing something. That's when you know you're busy when you can't list all the things you do, right? <laughs> yeah. Red 945, D. Wayne in the AM this past Friday. D. Wayne is a busy guy. A few hours a day, he's on air at a local radio station, also its program director. The rest of the time, he's doing a wide range of things for the business he's built for more than a decade. As D. Wayne with a hyphen, by the way. I decided to throw the hyphen in there because everyone had a performer name. And so I didn't want to be like DJ etch sketch or anything. So I just decided to use my regular name, but make it easier to pronounce. So when did this all start? I would say this started in high school. I was hosting pep rallies. I was probably a junior, like 11th grade. And I really saw that people were responding well. And it wasn't, I didn't felt good about being in front of an audience. It wasn't my favorite part. It was the fact that the audience responded. <laughs> Before that, there was beatboxing. Something the high school freshman on the marching band drum line, with an ear for percussion and rhythm, discovered and fell in love with. When I first started, it was the thing. Like, I was, I was D-Wayne beatbox. What is beatboxing? Beatboxing is the art of producing sounds using your, uh, your, your nasal cavities, your lips, your tongue, your teeth, uh, your vocal cords. It's anything in your body that you're doing to produce percussive sounds. <laughs> So this may be a train wreck, but I want you to at least give me a beatboxing 101 lesson. Oh, easy. Okay. Let's let's warm up first, right? Okay. Yeah, so you start loosening up your get arms. Big. Yeah, yeah, get, get big. big. Okay. The other thing is to start stretching these face muscles, right? We only talk all day and we rarely, yeah. We rarely. Can I do this too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead and stretch okay. them out. Last one, lip trills. All right, so... <laughs> <laughs> There you go, yeah. Because your lips aren't used to doing wild things either. So <laughs> now with the warm ups done, <laughs> you're ready to be a master. I want full control of what gets used out of this, by the way, right now. <laughs> no. You have three sounds. Okay. You have a kick drum, a hi-hat, and a snare drum. Okay. 
got blood on your face. A big disgrace. Waving your banner all over the place. Mike will, Mike will rock you. That's it. Mike the beatboxer. All right, man. There we go. Music. Hello. Hello. Lincoln. Back when he was just Dwayne Beatbox, TEDx Lincoln invited him to talk about the evolution of the art form. So emotion's actually a huge part of it. And I'll actually want a little crowd interaction here. What happened afterwards was an aha moment for the entrepreneur. Thank you. The emails I got said nothing about my noises. Great presentation. Would you mind coming and introducing blank, 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 blank? I was like, whoa. All those skills that I had built were the ones that got their attention, not me making all this noise. That was my aha. Let them see a cha cha. <laughs> he still beatboxes, but after UNL's Angler Entrepreneurship Program helped him hone his plan, Dwayne grew his business. Class of 2027, welcome to the University of Nebraska Lincoln. His alma mater is a frequent client. He's hosted a welcome event for new students several times. How do you get ready for something like this? Oh, I take my time and sit a lot in silence first. I, I really do. I take my time in my car, you know, listen to my music, and then I turn it off and just try to focus on what I want the event to sound like and feel like. Script review, a little stretching, visualizing the outcome, kind of like a golfer. Oh, and by the way, welcome to Nebraska. And a nebulizer, delivering moisture directly to the folds of tissue in the voice box that create sound. All part of his pregame routine. Right here at Nebraska. The part that people see me for, that's probably the last, you know, five to 10% of, of what I have to do. We got a little dash for cash action happening here. I'm with my man, Jimmy Brother. You are tall. Do you think people understand that this level of professionalism happens with what you do for a living? <laughs> no way. No way. People definitely are like, do you just make that up? Do you just come up with that on the spot? And sometimes I do and I have to, but no. Make some noise for the UNL drumline. Dwayne has been the face and voice for some memorable things during his career. Big things like Husker basketball and the College World Series. Powerful things like an event helping vets transition to civilian life. But nothing like this. Fans, welcome to the gorgeous Memorial Stadium for Volleyball Day in Nebraska! How are we feeling? Goosebumps. Nebraska is now a world record holder for an attendance at a women's sporting event. Go be brave. This is awesome. <laughs> to feel the energy and know that everyone is happy, everyone's on the same page, and I just get to add to it and push it a little bit. D. Wayne's had offers to take an easier road a steady job doing similar work for someone else. He's resisted that temptation. Like, this is my life's work. I think over the past probably year and a half, I've made that realization, which I've been doing it for a while. So it's, it's wild to think that being a master of ceremonies is actually my life's work and it feels like it. In Wesleyan's theater shop, they're busy building sets for the next production. Across town, there's a guy with a toolbox in his office who's building something that could make robotic surgery more accessible. I like to build things. I build a lot of things. I build stuff at work. When I go home at night on the weekends, I build stuff there. So um, I've kind of always been that kind of guy. Here's the big thing he's building now with his company, Virtual Incision, a robot surgery platform called Mira. Here's how it works. This part is inserted into the patient, two arms and a camera. It's like we've shrunk the surgeon down and put them inside the body. Mirror has different instruments, graspers and, and scissors. It has uh, cautery energy so that it can burn and cut at the same time and, and prevent bleeding. And it really goes in there and dissects tissue and performs the tasks that are required to do surgery. 
The surgeon operates the robot with foot pedals and hand controllers, here in a mock surgical suite in the virtual incision office. Tell me how this works. Yeah, sure. So first of all, get comfortable in the chair. You should always be comfortable when you're using mirror. So we have these arm supports for your elbows. And then I always tell people it's like a cowboy. He's got this two six guns, you sit here and uh, you have a trigger finger and you hold these sort of pistol grips. You ready to try it out? Yeah, my turn. Trying basic tasks, Ferreter says surgeons use to learn how to use these tools. One foot pedal is a clutch releasing the hand controllers. Another moves the camera. My hands control a grabber and a cutter. The 2D, 3D transformations, what's hard for civilians like you and me? Yeah, good start. But unless your insides are foam tubes and pegs, you probably don't want to see me in the operating room. The concept is similar to robotic surgery tools commonly in use for a couple decades. The big difference? Small size. First of all, it's very easy to move our device from room to room. That's kind of unheard of in the world of robotic surgery, that the fact that you can roll it into a room and set it up in just a few minutes with just one person. The small has economic impacts. Small can mean cheaper or less expensive, and that has advantages in our healthcare system, obviously, as well. So really what we're focused on is just more access. Now we're down to Wesleyan's costume library. It's billed as the largest in the Great Plains. There's hats and shoes and military uniforms that go all the way back to World War I, ABBA and Elvis costumes, animal suits, and this mysterious red blazer that you saw at the beginning of the show. It's part of our next story. How? <laughs> You'll just have to see. The folks here call it nerd creativity, and it's all over the place. So there's gonna be lots of fun stories for us to tell, including the folks who create costumes and dress up as pop culture characters. They're everywhere. Maybe that's why something just doesn't feel right. I think I need some help. So we <laughs> turn to superstar cosplayer Amanda Fellner. What if? So what is cosplay? Cosplay, uh, the word itself comes from two words. It's costume play, and that's really when it all boils down to it. That's that's the point. It's, it's dressing up in a costume to have fun. I guess I've always been into costumes. Halloween was my favorite holiday, of course, as a child, and it was for the costume component. I didn't really care that much about the candy, <laughs> and that's still true, actually. Amanda's definitely got a thing about collecting nerdy pop culture stuff. As you can see, I do, no, no, no. I do I enjoy think you, collecting I, some things. <laughs> you've got, there's like a tiny little bit of shelf space, I think, up above. Uh, yeah, yeah, there I, ha I still could... have some space. Yeah. She also has a theater degree, has done professional costume design, and works at a craft store running quilt machines. A perfect fit for cosplay. She likes translating animated characters into real life, but has created a wide range of costumes and won best in show a few times since she got started. So in 12 years, any guess how many different characters you've created for yourself? It's actually probably around 40 at this point. So what's the hardest one you've ever had to do? Oh man, a uh, character from the, the cartoon Gargoyles. Uh, her name's Demona and she is a gargoyle. So she has wings and she has a tail and she has, they're not quite stilts, but they're like elevated platform shoe things that I had to build. So she had a lot of components that were pretty challenging. Now she faces her greatest challenge, okay. me. I think it'll work. Okay. So we already talked about what I'm gonna be. How do we get there? All right, so I think we need to do a little bit of work. What do we do with the hair? Just came out of a package. We. <laughs> Need to trim it down a little. And this is kind of rare. Most of the time you're making your own stuff. Yeah, usually. Or with wigs, I, uh, I often have to purchase one and modify mm -hmm. it to the right thing because I'm usually doing some sort of strange cartoon. Mm -hmm. This is like a strange cartoon. <laughs> and this will hold me for a few days? Yeah, you, okay. you should be pretty good. First step. Mustache. I just want to see what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really not bad, actually. My hair used to be this color. What's that doing? So that's trimming down the actual hair part of this mm -hmm. middle piece uh, without just giving it a straight cut. Can I try it for a second? Sure. 
You're a lot faster at this than I am. <laughs> I do have uh, practice. Yeah. Is the detail part the fun part? It can be. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> or. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I care this much about this little piece? Yeah. But that's just me. Am I going to be able to eat with this thing on? It's just a little, little bit that we did, but it's a lot more realistic. Am I ready? Yes, I think you're ready. Here we go. So I think. <laughs> I think you look great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for help. Of course, of We're course. Off. We are. Yep, I've become Ron Burgundy from the movie Anchorman. Mike, you have a story to tell. Are you sure? Do it. It's a story you were born to tell. Most people live a fantasy. Dark dreams, stark reality. Money, clothes, women, cars. All the things that make you a star. Insecurity and ego too far. I'm pretty sure you don't even know who you are. Now Ron and Burgundy and team are be off be in search of creators. Hello, Casper. Hi. Can I talk to you for Channel 4 News? Of course. <laughs> I'm an artist, and, and I do comics, merchandise, concept art, freelance, stuff like that. I've been um, a drawing since I was two, so it's been a long time. And I don't know, I also love anime, um, video games, coffee, cats, <laughs> all kinds of stuff, so. Tell me about like one of these. One of these your favorite? <laughs> I think out of these, I like that one the best because he's um, the villain of mm -hmm. the series, so he's a lot of fun to draw. And, yeah. Kind of dark and ominous. Yeah. <laughs> and a little, yeah, there's a lot going on yeah. back there, so. Which I tend to like. So. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of a big deal. A big deal? Well, I'd say about a medium-sized deal, but, uh... What are you working on now? This is from Metroid Zero Mission. From Which the, is? From the Game Boy Advance. It's a okay. Metroid action-adventure game. It's a remake of the original Metroid from the early, from the mid-80s. Okay. And uh, it's one of my favorite games of all time. I love the Metroid games. The idea is that I am effectively recreating the look and the aesthetic of pixel art from classic video games. I'm of the age where, I mean, most of my childhood was, was effectively defined by this stuff. I ended up working with computers for a living, uh, working with data for a living, and I largely thank my career today due to the fact that I've just always had an interest in technology, and that is largely due to the fact that I was exposed to video games at a very young age. So how did you get started creating paintings with this old school retro video game look. Great question. It's hard to, I don't even really have a good answer for that. I don't have any artistic background. Talk about the process. The process is I take a T-squared and I grid the entire thing out in pencil. I go with quarter inch pixels. It's just a, a unit of measurement that I'm comfortable with. So I grid it out, grid it out like a graph paper. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of peel it apart color by color. I'm making sort of a mustardy yellow. I tend to try to invent these things in the fly, like, oh, this is boring mustard, so it's BM. And I'll just come in here, give it a label in there, and if I need to figure out where that color goes, I can just hide or show the layer and keep it kind of selected. And as I peel them apart, I can see what's left and see what I haven't gotten to yet. You know, you look at it here, it doesn't look like anything. You zoom out, you squint a little bit. You got it? It's funny, because I'm, I'm this far away from it when I'm working on it, and right. it just looks like nothing right and then I stand up when I'm done and I take a look at it and it's like okay what I do is a little bit off the beaten path and most people haven't seen it before so I get a chance to talk to people about it which is cool <laughs> how's it going look like Ron Burgundy man that's awesome <laughs> I work in marketing during the day, so this is a side gig. Definitely hit quite a few events a year. But yeah, I just do it uh, when the kids go to sleep. Talk about your stuff. Each of these is made from about four to 10 layers of the cut paper, um, and they're stacked. So there's some shading that's gonna occur in the dark. They have a different look to them. That's kind of one of the things I like about them is there's really two looks to them, one in the daylight and then one in a darker environment, so. Yeah. Do you have a background in origami or light boxes or any of this kind of stuff? No, no, not really. I have kind of a fascination with uh, lamps and lights and things like that, so kind of worked out. 
I definitely enjoy like, you know, nerdy stuff. So uh, that's where I, where I like to make also animals, some scenic stuff, but really, yeah, I gravitate towards nerdier stuff. It's just, it's just kind of my wheelhouse. Like so, what? You know, superheroes, that type of thing. This is the, actually the first one I made. For oh, my that's the one you made for yeah, your daughter. Yeah, for my daughter. Okay. So that's uh, it's pretty simple, but just enjoy that because of the, the memories that, you know, her enjoying it. The Star Wars one back there looks pretty complicated. Yeah, it's pretty intense. A lot of this is uh, yeah. actually that owl there. Um, that's a lot of hand cutting. That, that one took a lot of work. But I enjoyed the design of that one because it's it has a couple layers to it. So Best costume you've seen so far? I don't even know what it was. It was like an Egyptian uh, kind of look to it, like bejeweled. It was it was awesome. Not Ron Burgundy. Oh, uh, actually, you were leading me. You were leading me. Yeah, I should have <laughs> known. But do you smell like rich mahogany? <laughs> I immediately regret this decision. Oh. Do you want to talk to Channel Four News, San Diego? <laughs> I've been tatting for 13 years, and uh, that's my thing that I do. <laughs> so how'd you get started doing this? I saw a pair of barefoot sandals on Etsy that I fell in love with, but I couldn't afford. Now I know why. <laughs> because of that, I went to my local library, and they had a book there that came with a DVD. Even with that, it took me a week just to do my first successful stitch, but I stuck with it. And this is kind of an old school form yeah. of art, right? It this dates back to when? Victorian era. That's why I started working with the cameos, just because they were the same era. And then I kind of expanded slowly into, uh, I am a horror movie fan, mm -hmm. so I found more horror related cameos, images, things like that. My favorite piece is this one. So this one I actually designed. I think this one has like 10,000 knots in it maybe. 10,000? Yeah, nuts. And so this is a really complicated piece. It takes two shuttles instead of just one. What's a shuttle? Um, so this is a shuttle. And actually, I'll give you guys a short little demo here. Okay. Could I try that? With you want the... to try tatting? Yeah. And okay. then go around and wrap it around and your here, pinky. And then really tight here. Yeah. Okay. So hold it like this, yep. flip it over, and I wrap. So just wrap it, so just so it goes around like your this. hand. Yeah. Bring the tension back up on, on your th thread so that it's tight. This? Yeah, and you'll go over top of this green thread. Okay. Put the back of the shuttle underneath. So close your hand up. Okay. And we're gonna pull. And now you can open your hand back up. And I made a... And there you go, you made a knot. That's one knot. That's one knot. Out of probably uh, another 1,000 I need to make. So could I tat a new mustache? Because this mustache is... So there is actually a tatter yeah. who makes mustaches that you what? can stick on. <laughs> yeah. Anything that you see on my table is something that I love. What I tell people is that's how I feed my inner magpie. I'm able to go, oh, I like this, I like this, I like this, and then throw, send it out to the world. You're so wise, like a miniature Buddha with hair. He's in cosplay, I love it. Uh, how's it going? Good. And these are blowing up right now on my Etsy because it's really close to Shark Week. Uh huh. Music was what I'm trained in. I taught music for a while. Now I've I split my time between uh, teaching music privately and uh, this sculpting that I do. I got into sculpting because I, I just saw one of those videos that pop up on Facebook and it was like a demo, someone um, making something out of polymer clay. And it's just like, I really like doing this and just kind of kept kept doing it. And So I'm a big fan of Japanese anime. So I love when I get to do anime things. And my favorite things to make are these little chibi figures. And chibi means like cute. So they have like really big head, big googly eyes. These are hermit crab ragoons. So this, oh. this is my own design. <laughs> That is and I airbrush, for a second. Yeah, so I airbrushed says, the ragoon to try and look like like it's fried. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, I'm working on keeping my mustache on. It's yeah. a struggle. <laughs> Definitely a struggle. Stay classy. He matches. Look who else we found. Cosplay expert Amanda. 
I wouldn't be Ron Burgundy without her. What are you cosplaying? So this is Chitara. It's a character from Thundercats from, you know, the 80s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I really enjoy doing uh, kind of classic cartoons. And this one has been on my list for a really long time. The wig especially was a little tricky. It's got a bit of body paint happening, so that took a while. <laughs> and then fingernails or the claws. Oh my gosh, things, that looks you know. dangerous. <laughs> oh, they're not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling wearing that right now? Oh, it's fun. I uh, am very happy to be indoors in the air conditioning. Yep. <laughs> wigs are hot. Yes, yes, I wigs can definitely be as hot. A, <laughs> as a non-wig wearer, so. Just talk about the whole vibe of this place. It's a very positive and happy and creative atmosphere, and people are excited to be here. They're excited to be in cosplay. They're excited to look at all of the, the neat stuff that the yeah. vendors have. It's like a big family reunion. It is. It? So. Yes, it is. But a family you want to go see. <laughs> what is nerd creativity? I mean, it's just applying your creativity to nerdy sorts of things. You get ideas and you can just like feel the energy from uh, people that are making things that they love. You know, I feel like it comes from a passion I enjoy it, and uh, I think a lot of other people enjoy it, and I think now, you know, it's more celebrated than it, than it has been in the past. When you get to be around your tribe, it just really helps you feel like, okay, yeah, this is great. There are other people that are like me. We're all kind of, you know, weird oddballs. So did we pull this off? Oh, I think it's great. <laughs> Gosh, know? It's, yes, That's I've been great. bombarded with movie lines. I love it. It's, it's been funny. So do you understand then like part of the draw of cosplay? It's it's fun getting that sort of interaction from people. It is. I, I guess I didn't really think about it that way, but yeah, people are shouting out like Anchorman lines oh, yeah. and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's it is kind of fun. That's part of why I like it. <laughs> and that's where our story ends. We discovered a lot of nerd creativity. And just maybe. A nerdy host discovered his true self. You stay classy, Nebraska. I'm Mike Tobias. Here's a cool creative thing built specially for this theater. These lights represent what some famous Shakespeare lines look like digitally, kind of like what Emily sees when she's editing audio. So when we say, to be or not to be, that's what it looks like. Or, all the world's a stage. Well, thanks for watching this episode of What If. You can check out all of our episodes, our stories, and our educational pieces online, and learn about the original music we feature in all of those stories. And follow us on social media at hashtag WhatIfNebraska. Thanks for watching. But before we go, we've got one more little Anchorman nugget for you. What If? with four-time Emmy Award-winning host Ron Berg... Uh, Mike Tobias. With videographer, editor, Justin Cheney. Audio engineer, Emily Kreutz. Graphic artist, Lisa Craig. And your finishing editor, Ian Edgington. What If? On Nebraska Public Media. <laughs> Hit it again. You got it. <laughs>